really honored to be here uh, to share with you um, some of the work uh, that we've been doing um, uh, and some of the work that is in the book that we'll be um, sharing with you this afternoon. Uh, I always like to start off by thanking those of you who came, thanking uh, Edna and Linda and Michelle, Fatima, uh, everybody for your um, planning and for getting me out of the cold. Uh, so I'm really grateful to leave my jacket in the car in the parking lot. Thank you. Um, I always want to start by recognizing uh, my family and knowing that my family has roots here uh, in the state. It makes it even more special for me. Um, this is a picture of my grandmother, my grandfather, my granddaddy Kenneth, and my grandma Pearl, who lived in Eden, North Carolina. Uh, my grandfather, a farmer. Keep going. Okay. Uh, my grandfather, a farmer who, um, it wasn't until after I had written the book and submitted it uh, for the last set of revisions that I found out that my father was a member of a cooperative, an agricultural cooperative, along with eight other farmers, um, pulled their resources together and operated a store in the front of the house in the living room, and they shared, co-shared a car. So it's funny how when people say that writing is autobiographical, for you to find that out after the book has already been done, it was sort of like, okay, I follow. I'm going to follow my instructions. Just follow my instructions. This is actually a picture of my granddaddy in the grocery store um, that I remember so well. So I always talk about freedom farmers, and I want to give you just a, a sense of who freedom farmers are. Uh, the reason I have always wanted to be a farmer is that I believe then and believe now that the farmer is the only free man we have in our race, Benjamin Carr, 1914. This important relationship between land, food, and freedom is something that we, um, if you look closely, uh, you'll see these stories that, 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 are, that appear that are important. Um, starting working in the urban ag movement in Detroit and hearing the conversations around the importance of food production, especially for African Americans, I wanted to use the, the time that I have as an academic to, to find ways to support the food justice movement by providing the scholarship that was needed as we were talking and thinking about what strategies we would be using to feed food insecure folks in Detroit, but also to expand our reach and to build other communities. And so as any academic, you go out and you sort of look to see what do we know about black farmers? What kind of scholarship exists on black farmers? And so the scholarship really talks a lot about aging farmers. We talk about land loss. We talk about land ownership specifically um, and talk about the Colored Farmers Alliance, which um, Ali's piece talks about the Colored Farmers Alliance of 1800, uh, late 1880s, where 1.2 million black farmers in all southern states had organized these cooperatives, had trading ports, and were sharing resources. And so this story, this image is really interesting. And, and I wanted to not just talk about what do we know, but also what don't we know, right? As an academic, you sort of ask for the voices that you hear, but also the voices that are not there. And so I wanted more, you know, some of the scholarship was really sort of negative and talking about the fact that we are losing land, land dispossession, and what have you. But I knew that that couldn't be the only story. There had to be more to the story that explains the ways and the reasons that black folk were returning to land, but that this relationship between African Americans and land was so important. So I wanted to find a more nuanced analysis of the role of agriculture and the importance of agriculture for black farmers. There have to be some positive reasons that black folks do agriculture. We talk a lot about what happens to farmers, but we also often don't listen to farmers and we don't see their agency. And so for me, I wanted to change that conversation. I wanted to demonstrate or to explore what agency looks like for farmers and their contributions to building sustainable communities. And so, so much of what we hear about black farmers is sort of couched in the conversation of sharecropping, tenant farming, and slavery. And that can't be all there is. As, as Shimananda Adichie says, that's the danger of a single story, right? There's more to it than that. So what else is there? So I took the challenge, accepted the challenge, and wanted to provide and offer you a different way to understand the importance of agriculture in the African American community. But what are some of the ways? What did it look like? What did they do? What were some of the activities? And so my talk comments today will sort of sum up, um, just hit some high points uh, of uh, what's happening in um, um, in the Southern Cooperative Movement, um, how that led to what the work was going on, this going on currently in Detroit, and hope that you have some questions for me. It's important that we don't start off with oppression. Understanding oppression, but also recognizing and appreciating resistance is extremely important, especially when you tell your children. 
When you talk to children, you can't start with a deficit. And that's something that I talk to my students about. If I come to your house and I say, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, then how does that leave you feeling? The same with our history. There's more to it. So if we start off with an asset-based approach, we recognize that absolutely everything has something positive upon which we can build. So starting from an asset approach totally changes the interaction, changes what we're looking for, and changes how people feel. So I start off with this conversation of resistance. Uh, a lot of times people talk and think that the reason that we left the South was because of the work. Well, that's not true because we left and built cars in Detroit. And so given that we continue to work in various places and stages, and we continued our relationship with growing food production, you can't find a house, um, especially the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, everybody grew food in cities. That wasn't new. It just wasn't in the same kind of way. And so how do we honor and elevate this tradition? So I wanted to sort of complicate this relationship between migration and agriculture and argue that it wasn't the work that we left, it was the exploit of oppressive conditions. Those were the reasons that we left. And then how do we change the frame? How do we offer a counter narrative? How do we leave, lead with a so story that elevates our purpose, our cause, and connects us to the past and to the future? And so it is my goal to create scholarship that really does a more thorough explanation of who we are as black producers, as black farmers, the past and the future. What are the contributions of the black farmers to the civil rights and the black freedom movement? What is our, how do we use resistance as a strategy to grow and to build sustainable communities around challenging our position to the food system? And so I use freedom farmers in honor of Mrs. Hamer's Freedom Farm, but to really sort of describe the resistance, the strategies, and the intention of fruit producers to contribute. I think that when we talk about civil rights movement and the black power movement, we tend to privilege urban areas and don't recognize that we couldn't have done as much as we did without rural organizing, rural organizations. Talk about farmers and producers as active and not passive. Talk about the important work of the Southern Cooperative Movement in the late 1960s after the right to vote. There were cooperatives that were starting in all parts of, in places doing all kinds of wonderful, incredible um, things. Um, uh, Dr. Nimhart talks about the economic economic reasons that these cooperatives came to be, and I talk about the resilience, the resistance, the ways that people were able to do this as a strategy to stay in the South, to stay on the land. How did impoverished land workers and those who had the potential to build do so and build community with almost nothing? If you think about what it meant, sharecropping and tenant farming, you go, you register to vote, you get fired and evicted from your home. Just think about what that must have felt like, and then to hear Mrs. Hamer say, that's okay, baby. Come on over here. I want to also make sure that we include the work of not just, so when I first started at Wisconsin um, as a land grant institution, um, my colleagues, I'm a sociologist, I don't study agriculture, I study farmers, right? And so when somebody said, you know, you use farmers and gardeners interchangeably, and you kind of want to sort of think about that. And also, I, you know, farm and garden, I was sort of using those interchangeably. But this conversation of who a farmer is was really important to me. And so recognizing that most of the ways we define a farmer is in terms of ownership of the land. I want to complicate that. I said, okay, so if it has to be, in, if, 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 if USDA defines it in this particular way, for my purpose, I want to make sure that we include all the people who grow the food that we eat. I don't want it just to be in terms of capital. I want it to be in terms of what it is that they do and how it is that growers are feeding communities. Because when we take it away from this capital kind of conversation, I think it includes Mima, who grew okra behind the garage. I think it also includes those of us who fought for the right to have provision grounds, slave gardens. I think it also includes those of us who grow community in community spaces where we don't even harvest any other food from the community spaces, but we do so so that our children have something healthy to eat. So then what then are the research questions that led to this investigation? I think that as social scientists, we like to categorize, we like to theorize, we like to understand and over-explain. I'm hoping I'm not doing that. But I did want to sort of say, if we think we know what we know about social movements, does agriculture expand our understanding of what it means to resist? And how have black farmers organized in collectives and cooperatives as a strategy against racial and economic oppression? 
When I spoke earlier about the role of farmers in the black power and civil rights movement, I think we know a lot about the civil rights movement. We know about the ministers of the civil rights movement. We know about the songs, the freedom songs. We know about the students who traveled to Freedom Summer to help organize folks in Mississippi to uh, register to vote. But we almost hear nothing about the black farmers who were there, who were organized, who housed, clothed, and fed the, or the, the, the students who came. And so this picture really captures what I think is important. The freedom riders are coming down to Mississippi and the farmers are waiting them. We could not have been successful as a movement had it not been for the farmers, but yet their voices had been muted. How can this be? When you think about a lot of the scholarship on how do we feed, uh, uh, how do we feed the next generation or generations to come with a changing climate, and you don't ask producers. I, I don't get it. How, how, how can it be? How can you talk about a sustainable community without not talking to the folks who provide our food? And so this is one example. There are several others. This is the Mississippi Freedom Labor Union. I wanted this to be on the cover, but we couldn't get the rights but I wanted it. Um, just because I, I love the image of not just food, not just growing, but also resistance and resilience. Anytime you talk about black agriculture, I think you'd be remiss to not talk about um, the three wise men and the sister who showed them all how to do it. So we talk about Book, um, Booker T. Washington, who started Tuskegee, and, uh, T Tuskegee University. Um, when we think about his importance and his contributions, we know that Tuskegee is the first in agriculture, um, both in terms of extension and in terms of meeting the needs of those who were uh, providing the labor. But what I don't think we recognize is that a lot of the students who graduated from Tuskegee left Tuskegee and then established Tuskegee-like institutions on land that they that they have owned. So they would create these other entities throughout the South um, to Tuskegee, similar institutions that I think are important. And it's said that at the time of his passing and a few years later, that he had helped over a million farmers based on the model that he had des designed. We have to also think about Du Bois. Um, du Bois is often ignored or overlooked in conversations of agriculture, but his work on cooperatives, um, building on Dr. Nimhard's important, important work here. Um, but his idea was segregation is an unfortunate condition that we're suffering from, but how can we use segregation to organize these cooperatives and collectives and then use our economic resources to build as we then decide how to engage? I also think that it's overplayed this debate between Du Bois and Booker T. Now, while they did have differences of opinion, I argue in the book that they eventually came much closer than many would have us believe. You cannot ignore my favorite, George Washington Carver, whose quiet, committed dedication has been recognized for some of his inventions, but not for his commitment. The original reduce, recycle, reuse. I argue that he is the founder of organic sustainable agriculture and not Rodell. And he should be remembered in this way. Um, there are many stories about him being in, the, in his lab with the, with the um, shades drawn because he didn't want the folks to know how hard he had been working. What I love about him, so many things, but especially that he didn't feel like students had to come to him in order to make sure that they were able to benefit from his information. He would take the information, create, uh, they created the movable school, and they went to where people were. And of course, Mrs. Hamer, the sister that showed them all how to do it created Freedom Farm, met the needs of so many, and had an idea whose time has come around again. So what is the methodology? Uh, I did historical, primary, and archival, um, uh, archival data, secondary sources. I did semi-structured interviews with food activists and food growers. I, had, I was keeping a, a roster of over 40 black farmers, collectives, and cooperatives from 1880 to 2018. Um, and what I did, I organized their various activities into categories. And those categories then became the foundation for collective agency and community resilience that we'll be talking about in just a moment. I wanted to write the book on all of these organizations from 1880 to 2018, but of course my historian friends are like, Mo, you'll never get finished. Get the book so you can get tenure. <laughs> so that story continues. We'll figure out how to include more work on that.
What are some of the archives that have been gracious enough to hold these papers? Um, Mississippi Department of History, Amistad, Wisconsin Historical Society, Tuskegee, Birmingham, Alabama, Schomburg, and Walter Ruther. And if I may offer just one word of advice to all of you working these incredible organizations that are gathered here today, please keep your records. The work you're doing is so important, as is the keeping the records. It is so important that you keep your records, that you have historical biographies, that organizational biographies, that you make sure this information is useful. What are some of the examples of the organizations? The Colored Farmers Alliance had 1.2 million farmers. Baldwin Farms, Southwest Alabama, Farmers Collective Cooperative Association, New Communities, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, and Freedom Farm Cooperative. So as social movement scholars, we try to organize the ways that people resist, right? And when I, when I say resist, I mean there's an economic, social, political condition that we're dissatisfied with. And given this condition, we've decided we're mad and we're not going to take it anymore. So what are the various ways that people resist? And the scholars have decided that Rojas says that there's disruptive and non-disruptive. So disruptive may be a, a march or a boycott or a protest. I'm actually stopping business from happening. Non-disruptive may be a silent a, 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 a hunger strike or something where I'm making a statement, I'm doing something in opposition, but it doesn't come in direct contact with those I identify as oppressive. Everyday resistance, both Scott and Kelly talk about just everyday acts of resistance. You're just like, I'm having an individual protest moment. I've had a few in my day. I know why I'm upset. I'm not going to do it. I may not have a political argument or analysis around it, but I, it is something where I'm demonstrating my own agency. My dear friend Bahati Kaumba at Spelman talks about gendered strategies and the ways that women resist within our spheres of influence. And my work complicates this disruptive and non-disruptive by offering constructive resistance strategies. I remember starting this research project and I was talking about gardening as resistance and somebody said, so what, are you gonna walk up to City Hall with a rutabaga? Well, in addition to the fact that I love the word rutabaga. <laughs> no, it's not, but, but how do people involve in growing and food production as a strategy to change the social, political, and economic condition of their reality? While you may not look and say, hey, that sounds like somebody's resisting. These constructive strategies, the energy is not directed outward, it's directed inward. So a protest march, a boycott, we're protesting. Building a garden, creating a community-based food system, that is constructive. We're turning our energy in, inward. And so we'll talk a little bit about that strategy. There's probably no subject more important than the study of food. You see why I love him? <laughs> so collective agency and community resilience is a theoretical framework that came from the analysis of the records of several of these organizations. As a theoretical framework, my job is to explain how these organizations function, how do you categorize their activities, and how did that lead us to freedom? How does that lead to freedom? So when we think and talk about collective agency and community resilience, there are three strategies, three ways to see this occur. One is commons as praxis, the other is prefigurative politics, and the third is economic autonomy and independence. Most of the time when we talk about agency, we think about and study agency from a psychological perspective. I have made the decision to change this social, political, economic condition of my life. But I don't think it captures what happens when a community decides we are going to change and transform the conditions of our lives and those of our children. And so for me, this collective component cannot be ignored when you look at the transformation of Detroit especially the work of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. So collective agency is a social, ag social actor's ability to create and enact behavioral options necessary to affect their political future. Resilience is often um, understood as what happens after a community has suffered a catastrophic event. I know we know catastrophe in this current moment, especially given climate change, but it recognizes the way that communities come together to support one another. I think that's an important, profound way to look at how people come together, people who may not have known each other or ever had conversation coming to help one another, but I don't think it's fair for us to do an analysis of the way that people respond to a catastrophe without interrogating the conditions and the structures that make certain communities vulnerable to those catastrophes to begin with. So we can't say, oh, look at how wonderful people are without saying, oh, this is a whole, uh, it's a, uh, an error in the system that we have to adjust, we have to fix. 
So for me, community resilience, ways to adjust, withstand, and absorb disturbance, and to reorganize while undergoing change. Emphasizing the structural approaches to community engagement, including types of indigenous knowledge, emotional experiences, intra interracial uh, exchanges that communities need in order to adapt to unforeseen conditions. So what are those strategies that we mentioned? One is commons as praxis. This is an organizing strategy that emphasizes community well-being and wellness for the benefit of all. So that means that we make decisions about those resources we have as we decide where to go from here. Shared ideology moving from the individual to the collective. Talking and thinking about cooperation and the collective. Looking at community decisions around the shared spaces and resources like land, water, seeds. And it moves us from thinking about conditions as oppressive to liberatory. Here's an example. No individual has title to or complete use of the land. In order for any people or nation to survive, land is necessary. Cooperative ownership of land opens the door to many opportunities for group development of economic enterprises, which develop the total community rather than create monopolies that monopolize the resources of a community. Mrs. Hamer was talking about shared land, shared resources. What is prefigurative politics? Prefigurative politics is sort of acting as if. Right? If you're thinking about the before um, 1960 uh, right to vote, 65 right to vote, um, you're talking about people who were disenfranchised from the political process and even after given uh, the right to vote, we were still um, discouraged and continue to be discouraged from uh, participating in, in voting. And so prefigurative politics is the construction of alternative political systems that are democratic and include processes of self-reflection. And so within our organization, while we may not be able to vote outside of the organization, in the organization, we vote, we do all kinds of activities that make sure we educate, we do political education, we have free spaces where we can talk not just about what's happening here, but how what happens out there also matters to us here. It's a strategy of self-management, but also just making sure that we share ideas on different strategies. Here, Washington is talking about what we need to do. The great body of the Negro population must live in the future as they have done in the past by the cultivation of the soil. And the most helpful service now to be done is to enable the race to follow agriculture with intelligence and diligence. What is economic autonomy? Economic autonomy is an alternative system of resource exchange within the community which, uh, with direct benefits for its members. And so here we're talking and thinking about not having a resource extraction model, which means I plan a store or a business in your neighborhood, I patronize, or you patronize my store, your money goes out of the, your community. That's resource extraction. Uh, what we're thinking about and the way these organizations function, economic autonomy emphasizes how we can do economic regeneration, how my money goes from me to my co-op. The co-op also uh, has a dentist. The dentist also um, needs a daycare. Uh, you know, and so that money then goes throughout a community in multiple ways. So resource regeneration instead of uh, extraction and also thinking of ways of bartering or creating alternative economies and currency at uh, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network you work for so many hours at D Town Farm and you get D dollars D Town dollars those D Town dollars you can exchange for um, for produce that you've helped to contribute to and once again we see this importance on collective and cooperative and so here Du Bois is talking about, I think he's using a systems analysis to talk about the importance of the role of growing food. There exists a day, a chance for the Negroes to organize a cooperative state within their own group, letting Negro farmers feed Negro artisans, Negro technicians guide Negro home industries, Negro thinkers plan this inter integration of cooperation, while Negro artists dramatize and beautify the struggle, economic independence can be achieved. To doubt that it is possible is to doubt the essential humanity and the quality of brain of the American Negro. This is an important statement. He's saying that this segregation allows us an opportunity. That sounds like an asset approach. He goes on, we not only build and finance churches, we furnish a considerable part of the funds for our segregated schools. We furnish most of our own professional services in medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, and law. We furnish some part of our food, clothes, our home building, repair, and many retail services. We furnish books and newspapers. We furnish endless personal services like those of barbers, beauty shop keepers, hotels, and restaurants. How powerful is it to have Du Bois remind us of the assets that are already in here, involved in our communities, already involved in the black community? especially. 
So now I want to just show you a few pictures of what some of this collective agency and community resilience looks like and would love to be um, involved in some uh, conversation to talk about how this might be useful for you. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, if you see um, Mr. George Washington Carver on the far right top, it's so endearing because he's so unassuming. He's just sort of standing there. And I don't even know if the archivist um, had recognized him in this particular picture until I pointed it out. But the primary idea in all of my work was to help the farmer and fill the poor man's empty pail. My idea is to help the man furthest down. This is why I have made every process just as simple as I could to put it within his reach. This is an important message for all of us who run organizations, those of us that are meeting the needs of those that are food insecure, those that are organizing these communities, to make sure that there are no boundaries between what message you're trying to relay and the message of the organization, but also letting the organization be led by those within it. So what are some of the things against the co-ops? Uh, what, what were they fighting against? What were producers fighting against? Well, of course, sharecropping and tenant farming were exclusive, exploitive uh, relationships. They were exploitive conditions. Jim Crow legislation and legal segregation. The relationship between lynching land and labor disputes, Mrs. Sherrod, in the opening of her story, talks about her own experience where um, a farmer murdered her father. Folks who fought against the economic conditions were run off the land, they were arrested, often killed. This relationship between law enforcement and the Klan, civil rights activists were murdered, and also they rendered organizing, economic boycotts were seen as illegal. But yet how did they resist? Now to give land to landless hundreds of, oh, sorry, to give hundreds of landless poor people a chance at self-help, economic self-sufficiency, and political power, Mrs. Hamer has organized a farm cooperative. Acreage of fertile soil is available to the co-op at exceptionally low cost. A community of free, independent people can be built if financial help is given at this time. So recognizing that there may be some assistance that may be needed in order for organizations to be fully sustainable, but yet at least understanding that this was the goal is important. And so, what did coming together allow for them to do? I think this statement is really important. Down in Mississippi, they're killing Negroes of all ages on the installment plan through starvation. If you're Negro and you vote, if you persist in dreams of black power to win some measure of freedom in a white-controlled county, you go hungry. There's a way to fight against this nonviolent weapon of white officialdom. Whereas a couple of years ago, white people were shooting at Negroes trying to register. Now they say, go ahead and register, then you'll starve. So this is where Mrs. Hamer's brilliance really comes through. She's articulating here's a relationship between starvation the vote and the movement the forced land dispossession and forcing us away from the land her strategy was okay I got you we'll create freedom farm here's um, a pamphlet that um, George Washington Carver wrote help for hard times in this document he would say what you should do in what month to make sure that you were using the land most usefully and it's just a beautiful he's got recipes he drew his own pictures it's just a really nice sort of view of the advice and recommendations that he offered here Hamer says nobody told us that we have to move from Mississippi. Nobody tells you when you're, when you're we're not wanted. But when you're starving, you know. Where a couple of years, white people were shooting at Negroes. I'm sorry, this is a repeat. Um, uh, now go ahead and register, then you'll, you'll, you'll um, starve. Oh, OK. So here's Mrs. Hamer doing the testimony. And many people feel like this is where her story ends. And I feel like her story didn't end there. This is an important moment where she um, testified before the Democratic National Con Congress, demanding a right that the uh, black folks who were elected um, and th that, that were voted actually be seated. Uh, she said, they kicked me off the plantation. They set me free. It's the best thing that could happen. Now I can work for my people. Here's what happiness looks like for her. They created, a, at Freedom Farm, they had a cooperative store where 10% of all the proceeds from the store, from the garden were provided to uh, the co-op store where people could um, um, come and those who couldn't, were able to work would ac have access. They had a pig bank, which was the micro-lending operation. Um, you would get a pregnant pig, you would return two babies to the farm, and those, those babies would then go to another family and would be able to benefit those families. They started with 50 pigs. They fed oh, hundreds and hundreds of families, especially in the beginning. They had a sewing cooperative, and the sewing cooperative then had a daycare for the children. This is leather smithing. 
So the interesting relationship between my life, Madison, and Mississippi is that I learned once I got to Madison how often Mrs. Hamer had been to Madison, the Center for Cooperatives operating right there on my campus. And I was meeting, as I the, kept talking about the work, I kept meeting folks who actually knew Mrs. Hamer and were able to share with me pictures and images and have conversation. So this organization, Measure for Measure, um, of a group of progressives, white progressives, and clergy men and women um, raised a lot of money and sent it to Ruleville, Mississippi to support. And this is one of the tractors that they used, uh, that they sent down um, to Freedom Farm. They had a tool bank with a farm manager. They had subsistence crops. Those cash crops were used to pay the mortgage. They also had contracts with Atkin Pick Atkins, Pickles, and Heinz. Um, this is Reverend Wendell Paris at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. I put this picture in here because he always reminds me you can free yourself when you can feed yourself. Uh, here is Stanley at uh, Freedom. Uh, um, this is at um, Mrs. Sherrod. New Communities, thank you. This is at New Communities. I could have looked at the next slide. Um, not only was it important that we feed, but we also ha create housing, affordable, clean housing for, com for folks who have been sharecroppers and tenant farmers. And this is, these are the, 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 the um, blueprints for the housing development, 100 acres of housing. This is a, a picture of the shack where folks were living. This is what, these are the homes that Fannie Lou built. And so it is using collective agency and community resilience that we can talk and think about resilient communities, right? What are the things that resilient communities need to, in order to be self-determined, self-sufficient, but also be able to make some demands and, and to provide for themselves? So I think food, you can't talk about food without talking about land. Talking about land then also means we have to talk about quality education. Also, employment, talking, thinking, safety and security, transportation, housing, and health care. And this is what I think we're working on. I think we have a unique moment, a unique opportunity, um, a historical moment for us to rebuild and to think about where we are and where we'd like to be. The take-home lessons that I'd like for you to think about, one, how do we define success? There are many folks who look at what Mrs. Hamer did and said, but it wasn't successful. It depends on how we define success, right? I think that for us to pick up the baton and to think and look at examples like Detroit, Chicago, and Milwaukee, I don't know that she would say it was unsuccessful. May not have accomplished what she wanted at that time, but I do think that those lessons are there for us. Thinking about agriculture not just as oppressive, but also as resistance. If agriculture can be seen as a strategy of resistance, what are the other kinds of things, that ways that people organize and create community? Community building as a strategy of resistance. How do we make sure that everyone is taken care of and those needs are met? And I want us to also think and implement the importance of cooperatives. There are a few other publications um, in addition to the book that we have downstairs. Um, we wrote a separate chapter on Mrs. Hamer to sort of really detail the work that she did. Um, the book is available. We've done some more work in Covert, Michigan, Black and Latinx farmers for USDA law, um, uh, grant that we received. And also one of, the, um, one of my favorites is Sisters of the Soil, Urban Gardening and Resistance in Detroit. Thank you.